Okay, so Ari couldn't be here, his flight was canceled, but um, Vijit Ghosh, he is the CTO of Deutsche Bank. Vijit, thank you for being here. Very happy to have you. Um, yes, clap for these people, they are. We have Manoj Agarwal. Manoj is the MD up. of Cloud Transformation from Royal Bank of Canada, RBC. Manoj, thank you for your time. And then we have Toshal Kawale from, he's the VP of Engineering in uh, JP Morgan Chase. And before I begin, I just want to say these are extremely busy individuals and we love our end users and um, they use a lot of technology, have a lot of experience, so we're really thankful and grateful that they could give their time and share their, uh, their knowledge with us today. So this panel discussion, uh, we'll, we'll talk about four different topics. So we'll start with data first. So Bijit, um, I'd like to start with you. Uh, give us a sense of the scale that you face in financial services with, with data and, um, and, and the challenges and, and the yeah, solutions that, that you employ to address that. Yeah, so first of all, uh, the data is a gravity which we have seen since the last three years because of the various different use cases we're building in the AI and ML and, and also the generative AI. There's a lot of thrust of data which is coming. So previously it was petabyte, now it is moving and the projection is somewhere between the zettabytes we are, we are, we are, we are projecting into. And, and I think the, the primary uh, challenges which we see is um, there's, a, there's a no proper way we have the data cleansing mechanisms, which create a lot of friction in, in terms of how the data would be using, and then also uh, underneath it create a lot of model biases and the fragmentation itself. So, so when we are trying to fuse the, um, the generosity of the data between uh, the structure, unstructured, and the semi-structured data, that, that is where the major, uh, uh, the volume uh, challenges which you see. Like, and, 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 and of course, we're trying to make sure that you know, all this cleansing activity, all the uh, lineage activities are, are proactively monitored, proactively uh, um, have certain guardrails which, which gives uh, whenever we, this data is get, getting into the production readiness um, in terms of view. The solution is like, again, there's a lot of iterative solution which we're seeing right now, home build, and also uh, external vendor solution which you see. Uh, pri uh, primarily, we're trying to solve uh, the problem um, more from from the aspect of cleansing, right? Um, before we getting the data into, into the any pipelines, then the data has been cleansed, inspected, and, 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 and also uh, uh, from the security lens, does it really have any kind of PII or GDPR so that we can maintain the compliance aspect, right? Given that we have financial services, we are highly uh, um, compliance nature, compliance driven. We need to make sure that it has been inspected properly. And then I think uh, create the lineage aspect. Lineage in terms of how the data is getting connected between various different meshes and then and, and what is the source and then and, and what, what basically that can be leveraged into, into all the AI ML use cases and all. Thank you, Richard. So, uh, Toshal, would you like to add something to that? What, what is your perspective on, on uh, yeah. the scale uh, that, that banks correct. face with respect to data? And Richard talked about, uh, touched upon security sure, sure. as well. Yeah, uh, so good morning, everyone. Before I begin, I just want to have a disclaimer. Uh, whatever views I am expressing here are my personal view, and this this, uh, this has nothing to do with my employer. So uh, please keep that in mind. Um, Olivia, I think you you rightly said we are in an era where we are handling a lot of massive data, and as Bijit said, we are reaching to a pentabyte scale and all. Uh, one of the key aspects I would say when we are managing this kind of a huge data is how do you manage your data? It's all about having the right data governance, having right ownership, having right personas to manage those data. And that's where uh, I would say uh, the real challenge comes for any, any, any person who's handling such huge amount of data. Um, um, we, we, in, in, in our industry, the financial industry, uh, we are very, very particular about how and who is handling the data. And that's where the real skill comes into picture and the real challenge comes into. Again, uh, we have seen an exponential growth of data over a period of time. And 
with new technology coming in and new ways to handle the data, I would say we are poised for a very, very good future in terms of handling our data, getting most out of it, and I would say handling it in an efficient manner. So to sum it up, um, data governance is one of the key areas, and then trying to use the latest technology to handle the scale of data is a key, key thing to look at. Thank you. Thanks, Social. So data governance. And I'd like to move along to alternative data in financial services. So Manoj, and we've talked about this offline as well. What is alternative data? What do you look to do with alternative data and its uh, implications in the financial services? Yeah. First of all, good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, what is alternative data? So easy way to think about it is, if you are using any data that's not related to you, directly related to your business or your sector. So as an example, we are in financial sector. If we are using any data, say satellite images as an example, that's alternative data. For financial services, alternative data is nothing new. It's, it's been used for decades, right? So what's different? Like why, why do we care? You may have heard financial services is in a business of taking risk on and then managing that risk. Mm -hmm. And how do you manage your risk? How do you manage, how do you get better at managing your risk is you look at more and more data points. So traditionally, if you are, if you are just looking within the sector, you are looking at, say, the transaction data. You are looking at the customer behavior. You are looking at the common indicators that you see coming from, the, say, Federal Reserve or any of the financial entity. But the moment you start adding alternative data, as an example, I gave one example of satellite data. Another example is if you are looking at, say, the parkings in mall. Mm -hmm. If those parkings are consistently full or the, the, you're running out of spaces, you may say there's something happening, happening in the retail sector. Maybe it's positive, right? So all these, uh, all these data points feed into your risk management feed into how you evaluate your assets, how you calculate, uh, um, how you calculate your portfolio risks. It, again, wealth, if you're looking at wealth management, if you're looking at other asset classes, like insurance as an example, another example I like to use is if there's a hurricane, what will happen? Will people go to Home Depot more, mm -hmm. as an example? Um, so th those, are, those are the examples of uh, uh, alternative data and how this alternative data is evolving financial services. Now, why am I talking about this now if it's been used for multiple decades? The reason for that, if you look at the, uh, the compute innovation, uh, take as an example with Kubernetes, uh, what's happening with Kubernetes, you can scale within a data center, across data centers, across multiple public, uh, uh, public cloud, on demand, you can, you, can, you can do that as per your business needs. Same thing is happening in data capabilities. The amount of data capabilities, the maturity of data capabilities is growing. What does that translate into for us? The researchers, the data scientists, now they, have, they don't need to worry about underlying infrastructure as much. They can ta start taking advantage of their math skill, their research skill, and they focus more and more of that. That's number one. Number two, the availability of the data. You may be familiar with the marketplaces. Um, I'm not going to name the tools, but you may be familiar with the marketplaces where data is accessible, you can go click and drag that, uh, drag that data, as an example, in AWS or Azure. So the availability of that data makes it more lucrative for the researchers to include that in, in their research. And then the, the, the third part of it is the growing skills of dealing with and working, uh, working with alternative data. So all, all these things contribute to, um, uh, contribute to financial services doing risk management in a, in a lot more modern way. But at the same time, uh, I would leave you with this in alternative data. It's not easy to deal with that. So if you look at, as an example, if you look at the weather data, if you go back 100 years, maybe it's written on a piece of paper, right? So now how do I get to that data? How do I, how do I scan it? How do I make sense of it? So the amount of, uh, amount of data formats, data volume, how do you get to that data? Number of these challenges are still with alternative data, but those are getting solved, uh, solved really fast. So that's what alternative data is. That's, that's so interesting. I didn't know that with a panel of uh, 
financial services uh, leaders will talk about satellite data and weather data and uh, and parking data. I mean, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Bridget, do you want to add something to it uh, with respect to synthetic data? I know you had mentioned ones. Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a lot of scopes how we trying to leverage uh, um, our artificial intelligent models uh, with the synthetic data, right? And also trying to replicate the use cases which is closer to impossible to, to replicate with the, with the normal data which we have right now in our scope. So I think that is where, you know, we do see uh, uh, there's an emerging segment of se se um, synthetic data which you can do uh, testing, model testing, model validations, uh, and, and also uh, trying to see your, how your model uh, can bias and have the proper level of interpretability in, in, in that sense. But at the same time, validating your hypothetical use cases to, to make sure that it is, it is validating before you moving into the POC to, to, to the other different segments and, and, it's, and having the adoptions. Okay, so the, the cleansing part and is, is important that you had touched upon earlier. Absolutely, yeah. it is, yeah. yes. So moving along from data, we got some interesting in, insights uh, to Kubernetes, uh, because this is DOK. So um, Vijit, I'll start with you again. Uh, financial services, what is the love for Kubernetes? Why Kubernetes? Yeah, I think <laughs> Kubernetes become a de facto standard uh, um, in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the pass, uh, and also how uh, the segment is growing in terms of how we wanted to have a much less manageability in, uh, uh, wherever we do see we want to deploy our, our workloads. Uh, and I think with, with that sense, uh, um, Kubernetes not only give uh, all the non-functional elements which is required, but also uh, and the resiliency, the reliability, and, and also the scalability, right? For example, we are doing um, uh, 12,000 transactions per second in the investment banking where, where, where a, a, even a micro and millisecond matters, right? <laughs> when you're doing, when a trader captures the trades. So I think that is where we need a more, uh, uh, a dynamic resource allocation kind of uh, uh, a prototype which give you the location which is needed immediately and effectively, but at the same time uh, give you a scale back uh, when, when you have the concern in terms of the cost, right? And also the visibility, de facto visibility in terms of uh, how you want to orchestrate, how you want to have more, uh, uh, more cost-centric uh, elements in, into the observability coming to the sites. Well, th yeah, thank you. Um, Toshal, anything to add on Kubernetes? Yeah, I, I would say um, we are blessed uh, to, ha to be in this era where we are actually adopting a lot of DevOps practices. And that's what I actually have accelerated the use of Kubernetes. And, and since we are in CNCF event, the ecosystem is so tightly coupled, I would say, in terms of giving you a lot of features which can complement your Kubernetes uh, environment. Yeah? We have uh, the monitoring tools. Yeah, we have uh, uh, tools which gives a lot of visual data to us. We as a human are more inclined towards the visual data. Yeah? So, so I would say that that flexibility is available for us, and, and that is complementing the way we are actually using our data, we, we are when we are using our application, and Kubernetes is providing that that scale to us. Uh, it has its complexities, but again, uh, it's it's a kind of a uh, what you can say it's it's a order in chaos which we are actually everybody is working with Kubernetes. Yeah, and I would say that's the beauty of it. Uh, everybody is actually saying it's complex, but again, we can't live with it. Yeah. yeah, and and that's that's the beauty of it. I I would say, so it it will be there and it is going to help us when we are now uh, going from um, let's say a petabyte of scale of data handling uh, thousands of application to ten thousand application. So it is going to stay there and it is going to help us in the long run. I would say. Thank you, and that that's 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 an important point amongst many that you made that the the community, the CNCF, the the system that we have here, that's very helpful. Uh, let's talk about deployment strategies, Manoj. Um, with the scale that we are talking about, Vijit said 12,000 transactions a second, or millisecond or something. With the scale that, that you guys deal with, what are the deployment strategies? You touched upon it a little bit earlier, but... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll break my answer into two parts. I, I thought maybe I'll walk you through what are the some of the key factors that go into making a decision on 
how to deploy, where to deploy, and how do we make sure that we stay compliant with the policies that our panel here talked about. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the top five ones, and then we'll go, get into how that affects the deployment strategies. The first one always, we're looking at from our business commitments, business SLA service level agreements perspective. So as an example, if, if, you, are, if you are trading, your deployment strategy will be you have to be as close to exchange as possible. Yes. It will not make sense for you to deploy in another country and connect to like New York Stock Exchange as an example, right? So uh, uh, maintaining your business SLA, making sure you get the best price uh, for, for your clients, right? That's, that, that's the first one. Uh, second one, we just talked about infrastructure availability. The, we need to make sure we have enough infrastructure in that location to manage the scale, manage the compliance, again, meeting your, meeting your business SLAs. And also, uh, you want to make sure the operational aspect of it, the, uh, uh, Tosha, uh, you talked about the tools, your operational processes, tools, can you deploy that? Can you have all those deployed in that, in that location and can manage that, manage that consistently? So the operational aspect uh, plays a big role in, in, your, in your deployment strategy. Um, another, uh, another thing uh, that plays a big role is you don't want your bank to go down when you're trying to swipe, say, your credit card or you're trying to buy something. You would not be happy with that. So resiliency in financial services obviously plays a big, big role. So making sure wherever we're deploying, is there an alternative where we can go and manage that disaster if, if it happens? If you may be familiar with Sandy, the hurricane that happened and that impacted the East Coast significantly. Right? And the data center, some of the data centers were underwater. What do you do? Does your financial institution go down, right? So when you're choosing your deployment strategies, you're, you're thinking about those dimensions is if, if this particular location where I'm deploying is not there tomorrow or something happens, can I do my business continuity? Can I do my, can I do my disaster recovery? So that, that, play, that plays a big role. Uh, Toshal talked about Kubernetes. Why Kubernetes? Is it simplifies some of those things um, in terms of deployment, in terms of virtualization, in terms of managing, managing your uh, infrastructure. Um, another one uh, that plays a big role, financial services, as, as I talked about alternative data. Data plays a big role. And the data classification plays even bigger role. So as an example, restricted data, your social security number, your credit card number, your address, you don't want that to be exposed. You, 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 you want as less number of hands touching as possible, right? It is the most governed, most secure data, as an example. So when you're choosing your deployment strategy, figuring out the right data classification, if it's a public data, as an example, as a, you have a lot more options to deploy. If it's a restricted or confidential data, you have a less option where you can go and deploy. Also, the data residency plays a role. So as an example, you may be familiar with GDPR regulation. If it's a UK data, it has to stay in UK. So imagine you have an application or you have deployment that de deployed globally, but you will not be able to use UK data outside of UK. So that plays a big role in your, in your uh, uh, selecting your deployment strategy. And the last one uh, I will say is cost. Hmm. Obviously, the cost of cost of running your business, and you may be, you may have heard, financial services a margin compression business. Like uh, I was asking her yesterday, how much do you pay for your checking account? How much do you pay for trade? Zero, right? So it's uh, ten years ago, decade ago, it, it used to be there used to be fees, five dollar, ten dollar. 20 years ago, it used to be $50, right? So it's a constant margin compression. So as, as we choose our deployment strategy, we need to pay a lot of attention to making sure we're choosing the right infrastructure, right products, right locations, so we can manage that cost and uh, financial services can provide the services that it, uh, it uh, pretty much uh, guarantees its consumer uh, uh, to have uh, when they need it. So yeah. So interesting. So cost and resiliency and privacy, and you touched upon uh, touched upon a bunch of things. Um, so that was the landscape with respect to, uh, and, and the goal of this conversation really is, you know, these these leaders are facing these challenges and and um, adopting solutions that vendors like us bring to them. So hopefully this is giving some insights as to how they approach uh, some of these uh, topics. 
Now moving along to AI, which is the exciting thing these days. Bijit, you are a well-known thought leader. Tell us about a oh, well-known thought leader in, in this AI space. So tell us about AI in financial services. How are you guys thinking about it? It's the good and the bad and yeah, I think all what? good, all good, no bad. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's just the approach you're taking it. So, <clears throat> um, two years, so, uh, f and, and I think just to clarify, AI is not chat, chat GPT, right? Yes. AI is beyond more than that, right? So we've been uh, living and thriving the AI stage since more than a decade right now. We have a financial models running, the trading desk, uh, uh, our CRM system running in the AI. So various different use cases we have. So AI is very disruptive, and the chat GPT came in November 2022, and everyone just was like, stall, right? <laughs> so I think uh, uh, a lot of learning approach we have taken, how we wanted to move our scale from predictive AI to more into the generative AI. And I think that is where we have to go back to our uh, white paper and, and, and see how we going to c consider our architecture and, and, and before getting into the AI, how are we going to change our data strategy, right? So that is the foundation we wanted to gravitate toward. And, and, and what does it really look like in, in two years, midterm, short term, and long term, in terms of the investment, in terms of the projection, in terms of the use cases, uh, and, and the various different challenges we have. Like I was talking about, the data is segmented everywhere. How are we going to make sure that uh, that approach uh, uh, can be more uh, applied in terms of the unification of data, have more data lineage, have more data governance in, 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 the, in the pipelines. So that these are the few nitty gritty which we have to settle uh, before we getting into 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 the complete play of the AI. Now the AI, I think uh, everyone understand uh, in terms of uh, in the various different use cases we have uh, in the financial services, and and also some of the uh, incremental use cases which we do see uh, is is getting uh, uh, more elevated in the generative AI. And I think with with that, uh, we we trying to see. How are we going to create an abstract model with the Kubernetes uh, so that Kubernetes can give you the infrastructure which is needed? Uh, and, and basically, different segmentations uh, with the data, it can help us to, 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 to uh, have a, a, a layers of uh, interplay connecting to the infrastructures and all. I think uh, the biggest challenge we do see right now with the AI is, uh, is the data itself. Uh, and the secondary is the education, the literacy which is needed. Right, uh, um, I do see a lot. There's a, a, a there's a fragmenting points. There's a there's a different vendor talking about the solutions and all. I think that is where also we're trying to learn uh, how we wanted to validate with our use cases. What does it really looks like from the prominent aspect, and what does the investment uh, with the return of investment really looks like if you take those approach. So in terms of uh, so the future or, or even the present. So you're using foundational models, are you fine-tuning them to the use cases uh, that you see? And, and so fine-tuning and inferencing, what, where, where are, where is the financial services mainly um, yeah, at, yeah. I think at present, uh, uh, the lingua uh, for if you see if you see if you see the portfolio, majority of the financial services are residing in the foundational model or, or the training side, right? I would consider 60 percent, 40 percent of the inference, um, and I think that is where we're trying to captivate more and more to make the inference more realistic. To, uh, and I think that is where we do see the value is, is emerging because it's the immediate return of investments from that aspect. So in the future, I think it will be a, it will be a completely opposite more uh, the inference would be uh, clearly a good leader uh, and, and the foundational model would be uh, would be a play a pivotal role how the different aspect of agentic AI is growing. So on the topic of agents and the future will agents be logging uh, I mean do you think agents will be allowed to log into my bank account and and see what's in it. I'm, opti I'm optimistic about this, but I think there's a lot of things we need to learn. We need to, need to learn, and, and I think the clear outcome is to, to automate as, as much as we can, right? All the repetitive tasks, and, and give you the value for your time, right? But I think it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, inspection we need to do. Uh, and there's a lot of approach, clear view we need, we need, but I think I'm very optimistic where we're going with the genetic AI. It's, it's very exciting times for us. Nice. Um, Toshal, AI in financial services. Um, I would say um, I think we should we should remember and we should um, 
convey this to every one of us that we are human yeah and uh, we are good at uh, creativity yeah? innovation and all those things what i see uh, as a benefit of ai is how do i increase the efficiency of what i am doing right now yeah and that's what every bank is doing trying to doing yeah how do i get insight from my data very efficiently and utilize that to serve my customer in a better way okay be it some size, uh, kind of a summarization um, ke use case where i i give a summary of all the the uh, the rules and regulation to my customer in one click yeah that will solve a lot of problems every every one of us must have gone through all the term and condition yeah just zip through one page by page page by page page by page yeah but nobody has gone through the complete document yeah i bet yeah if somebody is there yeah uh, kudos to you but how do i summarize that how do i summarize the key point that is one of the use cases i would say ai will help me yeah uh, when we were talking about the alternate data uh, a lot of millennial gen z's are using the uh, financial products yeah how do i use their social uh, media presence yeah how do i look at their social pattern and how do i give them a product which are less risk averse yeah so so ai can help me in that space ai can give me a insight that what is the risk pattern of a particular person and how do i give him a product whether it's kind of a life insurance whether it's kind of some kind of a uh, personal insurance accident insurance or something like that yeah so that's where i would say ai is going to help us again um, we are we are transitioning from a period where three years back every other company was a data driven company and now um, in 2024 25 every other company is ai powered so the base has remained the same how do you utilize it how do you commoditize it that is where i think ai is going to play a role yeah manoj would you like to add something yeah it's, it's still it's still early days right yeah. i think yeah. um, um vijit and toshal co covered it uh, pretty well it is 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 still early days roi still needs to be seen but there's a huge potential right and uh, as as toshal said it right i look at it as what can we do better uh, on the things that we're doing today and are there net new potential opportunities that ai will create for us you asked yeah. can the agent log in in my account and see my balance maybe it is maybe it won't but that's a net new thing that has never never been done here right so uh, all companies not just financial services if you, if you look at like majority of the companies are are uh, are into efficiency plays trying to figure out what is the right way the another the in in my deployment i didn't talk about this one but it's like how do i use it do i give my data to you and you will give me something back do i build my models do i run it myself yeah. is it going to help me create a competitive difference right so the number of business aspects at play here that that needs to be figured out right is it is it a specialization specialized models is is am i going to create a net new product that is purely driven by ai we have seen some of the trading banking services are purely ai customer service uh, becomes ai right so are uh, so that's a, that's a, another another example of it risk regulatory uh, uh, we 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 talked about that it's how how will those evolve and impact ai is it going to slow us down is it going to banks are very heavily regulated Yeah. right so we need to see how those regulations will impact impact us does it change our time to market time to value curve on yeah. on the products that we are launching so yeah it's still uh, still early days there's a, as bijit said it's all it's all good there are a lot of lot of good potential opportunities uh, but uh, but to be seen so it's, it looks promising okay so yeah the roi is not defined but it is definitely a a huge productivity uh, improvement Uh, technology that we are seeing uh, now with ai comes uh, so we are at the almost at the end of our talk here so I'll, i'll end with bijit here but talk talk to us about the infrastructure gpus and um, it, that's a, a scarce resource an expensive resource and with the amount of ai that we are we are talking about here 
optimizing GPUs and uh, making sure you're, you're utilizing those resources effectively is must be top on your minds, right? Yeah, I think uh, um, <clears throat> GPU is very expensive, like because of uh, the supply chain constraint we have. Everybody needs GPU to experiments, uh, starting from cloud, hybrid, on-premise model. Right, and also there is a lot of co-locations are happening in terms of modernizing their workloads to, to make uh, uh, and, um, and, and, and make it more efficient in terms of how they wanted to explore the, the GPU marrying with Kubernetes or with the bare metal or with the VMs, right? So it depends uh, the flexibility it provides. But I think uh, is, uh, is uh, GPU like um, in terms of uh, the elasticity's needs, uh, or in terms of how you wanted to curate with your use cases like training or fine uh, fine tuning, there's a there's a lot of emerging needs, right? And and we clearly see that uh, um, there is a there's a completely a supply chain constraint right now. And I think as we're looking ahead in the future, in two years or three years, the majority of the business application will be moving from the CPU to the GPU. Um, is also because uh, the parallel computational it has, right, uh, and, and it, it is connected with the uh, uh, high level computational architectures uh, where you can get the immediate uh, with a micro millisecond response of time, the, the response which is needed, right? I think, and I think, I think with that only, uh, we do see uh, there is a there's a 360 view how we wanted to optimize our GPU not only from the aspect of architecture uh, model distillations uh, or or with the data uh, starting with the cleansing cleansing the data so that it can connect with the proper data and all but it's a 360 view starting with including the software optimization which is needed. Well, thank you, Vijit. And uh, with that, we are at the end of the time here. And um, I just want to mention that uh, I'm a, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Olivia. I am the VP of Product and Marketing in Avisha. And we have a solution on uh, GPU optimization. We also have a CNCF sandbox project. Please uh, check them out. And now I'll open up the panel for questions um, that you may have. for a time. Uh, I have a question about uh, generating the new data. As we see today, applications like Reddit, like Stack Overflow, are struggling to decide if they're going to in integrate bots as part of the solution. And as we know, creating the foundation model was a lot of it based on the answers it created many years ago. So my question to you is, do you think that in a scale of a few years, where we're going to see a lot of adoptions of agents and chatbots answering the solutions, it's going to be very hard to train new models and how it's related to synthetic data. Because in synthetic data, there are two of them. Two of them. One of them, it's you want to synthetic data to, to mimic the information because it's sensitive, but statistically you want to return the same results or the same predictions, but also to generate sometimes new data based on what called is why data and not big data. What are your reflection on this one? I know it's a bit more philosophical, but as you see a lot of it today and you're spending so much time on it, what is your thinking about it? Yeah, I can go first. I think, of course, there's the emerging segments of small language model and the tiny language model apart from the LLMs, right? Uh, and I think that is where uh, you, can, you can define the level of parameters which is needed. Uh, resonating with your synthetic data, right, which can replicate uh, and provide the pattern, which is understanding the user, getting the data from the Reddits, or getting the data from the GitHubs and all, We're talking about those semantics layers and all. But I think going forward, uh, um, uh, I, I'd, again, uh, this is completely my view. <laughs> I, I do see there is, a, there's, there is a need of the SLM because uh, uh, it, it not only provide the data clarity which is uh, needed, but also the small segment of data which we can completely control it, right? And, and also, uh, I trade very quickly compared to the foundational model where we, we need to have billions of investment coming in, which is not profound uh, approach in terms of the return of investment which you're looking, right? So I think the SLM with the synthetic data gives a, a lot of clarity in terms of the approach we needed, but at the same time validating quickly uh, uh, what are the approaches we're trying to take it. I think uh, just to add what Bijita said, I think um, 
we we need to avoid any kind of over reliance on what we are getting as a kind of answer for example you are saying uh, stack for overflow yeah uh, yes bots are can be useful uh, for doing some kind of uh, let's say a common task or anything but but the, um, the way we have to look at it is that whatever we are getting uh, as a kind of an answer to 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 the qu queries we have asked as as a prompt yeah uh, we need to be mindful that uh, we have to evaluate whatever the answer we have give, given uh, um, getting from the the any kind of a ai tool yeah and then make your decision whether it is the right thing to do or whether it's the right solution for your problem and they then take a uh, take a right decision based upon it so again the human creativity will uh, creativity will come into picture we have to rely on our own judgment um, answer can be very very simple yeah uh, the the tool can give you very immediately answer but again uh, we have to be mindful that what is right what is wrong we have to make a decision that 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 this uh, decision is is on us yeah so i would say yes yeah maybe just i will add one point to that i think problem statement will define a lot of this right like if you have a small smaller problem you're not going to go build like 100 billion dollar company to solve that right so the problem statement i was talking about the specialization model right and also you you want to make sure your time to market time to value is there if it's going to take you a year to solve that problem maybe it's, it's not worth it so i, I definitely see uh, this is again my personal opinion. I, I definitely see there will be a lot more specialization, uh, just like what happened in education, what happened in medical science, right? There was a one doctor that did everything. Now there's a specialized doctor just for a year or maybe the part of the year, right? So I, I do see similar things, similar things will happen happen here, but uh, it's, 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 still, uh, it's, it's still early days, like slicing and dicing data, making sure the uh, quality of the data, uh, uh, governance of the data, regulatory aspect of it, all those will play, uh, play into it, but definitely specialization will happen. That's my view. Thank you. Anyone? This one. Yeah. There's one question there. Hi, I'm Ramya. I'm from Nutanix. I uh, have a question for each of you to understand your perspective. Uh, when we look at applications that are driving financial sector, you have um, today probably a combination of both Kubernetes and VM workloads you know, uh, on, on it, right? In the future, do you foresee where you need an infrastructure that would support both the kinds, meaning are your legacy applications also being containerized and deployed in Kubernetes, or you see new use cases where there is an overlap with AI, uh, you would write new applications to cover for those, but maybe what's working well now will continue to be on the older infrastructure. Okay, um, I can go first. Yeah, um, I would say um, uh, you talked about legacy application. I think um, uh, take a classic example of a mainframe system. Yeah, uh, mainframe system were were very prevalent in um, some time back. Yeah, but now uh, we have taken a different approach. That yeah, whatever we can do with a mainframe system, uh, we can do it uh, by a containerized application as well. Yeah, so this pragmatic thinking needs to be there because. Uh, technology has changed a lot in recent times. Yeah, um, we should not have that tech bondage, tech uh, yeah, bondage, to carry into the future. So I would say uh, we need to look at a very pragmatic approach. How do you move from your legacy application and try to solve that problem with the new technologies, new tools, new features which are available for us, and take that approach. Yeah. So we need to rem uh, remove that bondage and and move ahead. I would say. Yeah. Bridget, do you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, I just want to add, of course, I think the Kubernetes uh, um, abstract away a lot of complexity, right? Uh, and also we do see there's a, a microservices uh, um, okay. nature and the adoption which is growing. Uh, uh, and, and definitely the Kubernetes uh, give you the, the resource allocation, the cost flexibility, and, 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 and also uh, a certain level of uh, um, abstract which is needed to, to make sure you have a control, but at the same time uh, um, in, in a minimal way, right? But, but I think is a, uh, uh, is a, is a 
is the approach we had to foresee, right? Um, of course, micro, um, micro segmentations, microservices, and also mainframe, which is growing right now. Um, mainframe definitely is uh, deprecating a lot because of the, because of the microservice and the Kubernetes adoptions. But in short, yes, that's, that's, that's what we are looking to, to have more adoption in the Kubernetes landscape. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you to the audience, and a big round of applause for our esteemed panelists here. <laughs>